A very good evening to everyone and, and welcome uh, to another FA webinar. This one is called Opportunities for Aspiring Coaches in the Semi-Professional Game. Uh, we have had an enormous amount of interest in this one. I'm really looking forward to not only speaking to our, our guests. Uh, we're, I think we're still waiting on one guest to, to join us, Andy Priest. I'm sure he'll be with us any moment now. But but not only speaking to the guests, but also welcome our, our two co-hosts as well. My name's Butch Fazal. Um, I'm the Coach Inclusion and Diversity Manager at the FA. I want to welcome, first of all, Pav Singh um, and uh, Pete Augustine. Pete and Pav will be looking after the polls that we're going to be running throughout the evening. Um, it's going to be 90 minutes of fun. Hi, Pav. How are you, mate? All good, Butch. Thank you. And Pete, you're, you're also with us. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Looking Excellent. forward to it. Fantastic. So um, I, I have got uh, four guests so far, but there will be five. And uh, we're just waiting on Andy to come and join us. But I think it's it's fantastic to 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 introduce my guests first of all, and then also to go through the format as well. We've got ninety minutes. Um, we've got five guest panelists, and we've got six poll questions. We want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, I think everyone that's uh, that's WhatsApped or messaged me in in some shape or form is really looking forward to hearing what not only our guests are saying, but also what um, some of the some of the some of the key messages that are coming from the semi pro game and more importantly, the opportunities as well. So without further ado, first and foremost, um, Hakan, Hakan Hayritten, uh, currently the uh, manager uh, or first team coach. Hakan, are you first team coach or manager at Maidstone United? I'm manager. I'm manager. Oh, the manager. Yeah. And you still the manager right now, aren't you, mate? Yeah, yeah. Just doing the <laughs> two-year contract, so I'm happy with that. That is fantastic. Hakan, and not only um, uh, managing Maidstone, but, you know, a, a, a fantastic career, not only in non-league football, but also in the professional game as a player as well. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, I know we're going to go through it a little bit, but, you know, that that fantastic um, two or three years you had with Stilly at Luton Town and, yeah, and getting yeah. the conference after a few years. Great to see you, Hakan. Irfan Cowley yeah, is my next guest. Irfan, how are you, my friend? Yeah, good, Butch. Fantastic. Irfan, um, you know, uh, again, right, when I asked you for your um, a quick resume of what, what, what your career looked like, and if I looked, it's a who's who of people that you've met and the experiences that you had, but currently first team coach uh, or at, at Chorley with the under-19s as well. You're overseeing the 14 at 21 programme, and we will also touch on that incredible uh, run that you had in the FA Cup as well. Welcome, Irfan. Thanks, Butch. No problem. Um, I want to go to Gavin Rose because, uh, you know, I actually, I, I've heard so much about Gavin, but never actually met him. Uh, and so when I started speaking to him, I got, uh, I got to tell you, I was inspired. Some of the work that he does, at, not only at Dulwich, but also with the group of players that he's got. This, this guy transforms lives. Um, currently manager at Dulwich Hamlet. Uh, Gavin, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. No problem. And and Pete, uh, we've got Peter Dinyu on the line as well, uh, manager at Carl Shelton at the moment, but also running a a, a college program as well. But Pete, uh, a, a a long career in the in the game as well, as uh, then transitioning into uh, a manager as well. Really looking forward to hearing what your experiences uh, are have been like so far. Welcome, Pete. Good evening, everyone. Excellent. OK, still waiting on uh, Andy. I know he's going to come on uh, and we'll we'll do an introduction for him when he does come on. I want to kick off straight away, OK, with the first poll. So if everyone can just quickly go to the polls. Pav, if you can ask the first question for the first poll, mate. Yeah, we're about to start that now. Uh, folks, I just want you to look at what is your highest coaching qualification? So start polling. Give it a few, yep. That's your highest coaching qualification. Pav, while those results are coming in, okay, I wanted to kick off the panel um, with the first question. Um, and so to the panellists, and as I'm looking at them from left to right, I'm going to go with Hakan, then Irfan, Gavin and Pete. And so the first question um, is, for the, for, the, for the aspiring coaches on the call, if you had one piece of advice to those coaches, 
um, who are looking to work in within the National League system or the non-league game, what would it be? Hakan, over to you first, mate. Yeah, I've always been quite vocal about this. They've got to be resilient. I've said this. You know, it'd be good to work with someone that you know. Um, usually in this industry, you'll only get a job if you know someone that's in a job. But to be resilient enough to keep knocking and trying to get opportunities the is the way forward and someone will recognise you, not for anything other than your ability, and then give you that opportunity. And, and I'm sure that most of us on here now have been that soldier where we kept on plodding away and we were resilient what we were going to try and do, even if we were young pros uh, to retire or aspiring coaches that were looking to get back in. I think it's very, very important that you don't give up hope and you keep trying and be resilient. I said this many times, I get plenty of these a month and I entertain at least 10 of them a month by giving them a, a phone call or a chance to come down and watch training or even shadow. So being resilient is the key to everything. And if you can get someone's got that in his locker, you're more than, well, I'm, I'm more than happy to help him as much as I can. So that's fantastic. Just before I go there, I wanted to, uh, before I go to you, uh, Fan, I just wanted to put a, a, a quick slide up. And I, and I just wanted to give um, uh, uh, coaches who are who are listening in an example of what the structure looks like for step one to six. As you can see, there's the national league there, and I think today I think we've got three uh, uh, three coaches who who are working in national league north or national league south, and then also in the Ishman league in, in in level three as well. But as you can see, there's some serious um, uh, the, you, you, the, the the game, the the national league system itself, with the amount of clubs that are in there as well. It's pretty staggering. Sixteen hundred and seventy six clubs, total teams in the national league at the moment nine thousand six hundred and sixty nine. You know, uh, like match officials at over fifteen hundred players. 56,000 players in the National League system. Pretty staggering numbers. I want to go to Irfan with the same question. Irfan, messages when it comes to um, uh, those who are aspiring to break into the game, my friend. Um, I think um, just echoing a bit on what Hakan said as well, um, I have to say resilience is a massive, massive factor uh, in football. And um, just want to talk about being prepared to give up your time. Um, if you are involved in football, um, anyone will tell you that it takes up all your time. You know, a lot of jobs um, will have certain times and specific slots what you, where you work throughout the day. Football doesn't leave you. It stays with you even before half 11 at night, before you're going to bed. Uh, your wife might be asking you for do this, but you'll be doing something else. Your kids will be asking you questions and your mind's on about, your minds will be thinking about, um, oh, I have, to, I have to reply to this person, I have to reply to that person. It doesn't leave you at all. It's always in your mind. And it's being prepared to keep giving up the time um, to 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 really focus on what it is you've got to do and what you want to do and where you want to get to. And I think sacrifice is a big word. You've got to make a lot of sacrifice and be prepared to to make them sacrifices. Uh, and eventually, you know, the hard work, resilience, and sacrifice will uh, pay off. Brilliant. I'm sure there's an, there's an acronym there that I want to work on. Um, Gavin, over to you, my friend. Um, I'd say perseverance, uh, pretty similar to the guys. Um, I think you need a lot of perseverance. You have a lot of ups and downs. You have a lot of things in your way um, and you can't, you know, you can't shirt them, you know. Um, when you first start out, you probably start out at the bottom um, and you can't look at who's at the top. You just got to worry about where you are, concentrating on being the best coach you can possibly be. Listening, learning, um, like Hakan said, speaking to people who are probably a few rungs up the ladder than you are, um, trying to get as much information on how things are done higher up and then trying to perfect it at your level, you know? Fantastic, Gavin. That is brilliant. Uh, Pete, over to you, my friend. Same question. Um, I think the guys have already covered it. Um, just you're, you're on mute, Pete. You probably just need to unmute, my friend. That that is a definite fine, Pete. Whatever happens, ten points <laughs> at the end, son. <laughs> apologies, apologies. Just a bit slow reacting. Um, the guys have covered it. Um, hard work, perseverance, resilience. Um, but I think for me personally, is trying to learn from people that have done it before you. 
Um, yeah. I've been fortunate enough. Um, I know he's on the conference, and I didn't know what's going to be on until he called and told me. But I learned a lot from Gav. I mean, I played underneath Gav twice as a player while he was manager. And luckily enough, I'm also friends with him. So, like I can say this sometime where you know, um, I was lucky enough to learn a lot from him, from watching him, from talking to him in personal situation and picking his brain, which whether he realizes it or not, I've taken into my career as a manager to sort of like, you know, all the good things I've seen him doing over the years. I've to implement so i mean the guys have said the resilience hard work but learning from those people around you as much as you can um, i think there's a key, pete there's a key message coming out about get yourself a mentor isn't there really yeah well I've got, yeah i've got keith bonus at the moment as well so yeah. i've had keith with me for the last three years and you know someone that's got a wealth of experience so i think i've been fortunate with some of the managers i've had and some of the people i've got around me right now that just sort of like make my life easier and if i'm doing something that i shouldn't be doing they will tell me so you know i mean i've been honest people around you brilliant mentors brilliant. brilliant thank you peter pav i want to go to the poll uh results what you got for the first question my friend it's great to see uh we talked about the real aspiring coaches we've actually got 34 percent of playmaker coaches on the on the call uh, today Butch but that takes it all the way up to sort of level one 33 percent level two 14 percent UEFA B 12 percent and UFA 5 percent and it's also great to see three percent of pro pro license coaches on the call as well that's fantastic thanks Pav really appreciate it I want to go to the second question and uh, I, um I'm sure that poll is closed now so we are going to go to the second question and I'm going to start with um I'll go with Irfan this time, and then I'll come back to you, Hakan, if that's okay. Um, do you think the non-league playing recognition deserves Irfan? Sorry, I lost you there, but what was that? No problem. Do you think the question is? Do you think the non-league game gets the recognition it deserves? Um, I think I think it could do with more exposure um, because if you're actually involved in. Um, National League, National League North or Northern Premier Eastern Leagues, what, what you'll realise is you're working with players that high percentage have been pros in the Football League or have been scholars in the Football League, some even Premier League. Um, just, just looking at our squad at Charlie, I think at least 80% have been pros in the Football League. We even have players that are playing in the Premier League. So the actual standard of player you're working with, a lot of these lads have had a good school and they've had a good upbringing. So they come in with a lot of qualities into your squad and into the semi-professional game. And and I feel that it could do with more exposure because um, a lot of lads will drop into and the non-league system and then lads will go from non-league into the football league does that there's that um, movement both ways and if you look if you were actually do, to do some research now you'll find a, a quite a high number of players that are going from national league national league north south or the eastern or the northern southern prem into the football league you know i've, I've first hand seen lads that have gone that way as well I think it's a really good point, Irfan, because um, if we think about it, when coaches who are listening in are going, you know, what, you know, if, if we're working at that end and, and looking at that slide that I showed you that, you know, step, step one or two, um, you're going to be working with quality players. There's no two ways about it. I mean, these, these guys are, have either had a career or, or, or are looking to, uh, to gain a career. So that's really fascinating. Well, just, I... just, sorry, just, just, just following on from that quickly, but is yeah. just to give you an example, this season we've, we've arranged like bounce games, friendlies against uh, PDP phase clubs in the football league. So that's your 23s, first team fringe players in the football league, league one, league two, even championship clubs. And they've been very, very narrow games. I think we've only lost one. We've beaten most of these, uh, these sides. And these are, your, these are, these are pros, that, that, so it just goes to show. Well, we, you cut one, you beat, you beat Derby in the third round. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know that's an example of where we are. Hakan, of course. Um, do you think there's a there's much of a difference there? Uh, do, do they get the recognition? I, I've always said that if you work in the national league, it's, it's equivalent to the second division. And I think the top ten teams or top seven teams in both north and south are as good as. The National League team. So I don't think there's a lot of difference. I think now, especially now, for a reason that the government's called the National League an elite league, there must be a reason for that. It's not just financial. I think there's going to be more recognition now that they've been given the title of it of elite. And um, 
I think that they deserve more recognition. I think now, next season onwards, you'll, you'll see that there'll be more recognition. The players, like Irfan said there, is absolutely correct. There's players that are dropping out that want to get back in. And playing at our level is a very, very good standard and very good level. For young, aspiring coaches and players that think it's not, well, I can tell you now that it is. I know from myself that we run a full-time operation, so does Dulwich. And there's other teams at our level as well that do that as well. So the recognition is there, I think. I agree with you, Fan. There should be more recognition. And I think it's a pathway now that the government has given the title to the National League as an elite. I think you'll see that there'll be more coverage around it now, more so than ever. Thanks, Hakan. Uh, Peter, then you can I go to you next, please. Recognition. <laughs> Um, I think he has had the recognition that he kind of deserves. I think, obviously, like anything else in life, money talks. Um, so to get that exposure, um, you're not going to get the same level of exposure as you would with the Premiership and Championship. Um, they're always going to get the most amount of exposures. Um, but I think non league does get enough, um, as much as he deserves. I think he's getting more due to social media and the fact that players and managers and clubs and teams could directly, you know, give information out, games, goals. You do see a lot more than you would have when I started playing. Um, and I think there's a massive amount of room for improvement. And I think it will improve as the years go on, as each club, social media platform improves, then that media exposure improves and then you know pro clubs will be able to see non-league players a lot easier than they would have you know 10 15 20 years ago that brilliant thanks pete i know the second poll's gone up already pete if only you could i don't know who pressed the, for the for the poll but pete if you arrived that early with some of the crosses i used to supply you <laughs> and a lot more gold than that, that's what i'm telling you that poll's already gone up i think around <laughs> and the question is pete what's the question for the poll my friend uh, do you work in a non-league game? Simple yes or no. So yeah. if it's come up, please answer. But where, where did you ever put a cross in for me? Bisham Abbey, Bisham Abbey, track course, A license. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you still can't remember. You, you still ain't arrived at that cross yet, son, that's why. I was so surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to go to Gavin, and then, Pete, if I can come back to you with the results when, when they're ready. Okay. Gavin, thoughts on, um, do, we, do, do you think the non-league game gets a recognition? Uh, not quite. Um, sorry, can you hear me, guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. I don't, uh, not quite. I think, um, as the guy said earlier, it's been a breeding ground for, for lads who are late developers. It's been a breeding ground for guys who've been released for whatever reason and then they give themselves the opportunity to develop again in non-league and then push back on. It's also been a steady career for many people. Um, we know that typically uh, non-league has been uh, an environment where you can work at nine to five and then you can come and you know train regularly two nights a week and play matches on a Saturday. And that's offered a lot of people a solid career as well. Um, but more in, more in terms of what it produces, there's been some top, top players come out of non-league football. Um, there's a lot of good work being done in non-league football. Um, the standard of the football is very good. Uh, there's good quality coaches and managers. Um, and I think it probably does deserve a lot more um, uh, recognition uh, publicly, I think. That's brilliant, Gavin. Just to remind everyone that there are there is going to be a QA. and a Last 20 minutes will be in a QA and a with the panel. So if you have got any questions, put them in the chat box and we will actually, uh, Pav and Pete will pick them up and then we'll go through the Q&A as well with the last 20 minutes. Um, Pete, um, any, res any results off that last poll that just went up? Yeah, so far what we've got is 31% um, are currently working in the non-league game. It's just got up to 32%. 36% aren't, and this is what I've, I find actually which is brilliant, actually. 95% would like, oh, 95, oh, sorry, I got, the, I got it wrong. 20% are currently working, 22% are, um, are, are, are not working, but 58% would like to work in the non-league game. That's 
Brilliant news. With the numbers that we got on this call at the moment, so it's a real opportunity to really um, to, to move forward and, uh, and ask the next question, which is a, a really interesting one, which, which is uh, the polls just closed, I've just noticed. Um, and I'm going to start this time with Gavin, if it's OK. Um, Gavin, what have been some of your key learnings from working within the National League system and, uh, and, the, and the non-league game itself for you? Um, personally, I'd say um, every year it becomes harder. So the better you do, you, you obviously come up against better coaches, better managers, uh, better players, and you need to continue upskilling yourself. Um, if you're lazy, um, what I found is you, you'll get left behind. Um, I found that you know the, the game has become more professional, even in non-league. Um, the amount of work that coaches and managers do uh, to prepare their teams, uh, prepare their players uh, to create a good environment, um, I don't think people in, outside of the game would realise. There's a lot of professional people working within non-league football um, and that's going down from the National League even down to the Isthmian League. There's a lot of very professional people um, and I feel that if you uh, want to take shortcuts, you'll get found out at this level. Um, and you've got to continue getting better and better and better. That's brilliant. Uh, it's really, really interesting that because that you use the word professional there and sometimes we, we, we think non-league, but actually, and we sometimes say semi-professional, but actually some outfits are, 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 are full-time. Yeah, we, we are. We're full-time. Um, I know I know Hackham's full-time as well. Um, there's a few others uh, who are in our level. Um and really, you're just trying to get yourselves uh, the right habits and get the players in the right habits. If you do go to the next level, near enough, every team is full time in the National League. Um, so it's, it's very, it's a big difference, you know. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Irfan, can I go to you uh, with the same question? Some of your key learnings from working within the National League system. Um, I think uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a coach, um, the game realism really, really kicks in because as a coach, you might start working in grassroots or you might work with a specific age groups. But when you're working in the, in the National League North, let's say, and you're working with men uh, in the performance end, there's a, there's a game realism that comes in and it, and it helps you as a coach to understand the real aspect of football. I mean, I've seen so many sessions coaches will do, um, but then you actually break it down. Is it relevant to the actual game? Does this happen on a Saturday uh, in the game? And I think that's where your game really comes in. And that's where a lot of young lads come out of the Football League after scholarship. They struggle sometimes a lot to, to, to grasp the, the level at National League because the game realism doesn't kick in until uh, after they become older and they leave that, that scholarship football they're playing. And, and that's something that, uh, as a coach, you really do need to grasp. And, and just, uh, it's, it's refreshing, really, to, to hear what Gavin and Hacken and Peter are saying because there's a common uh, ground between a lot of the things that we're saying here. Yeah, thanks, Hacken. Hacken, I want to go to you. Um, some of your key learnings, I mean, over 600 games, uh, not only in, in, in non-league, but also league. As, as well, um, yeah. you know. What, I think, I think this question is a two-pronged question. If you're going to be a coach and if you're going to be a manager, I mean, we're all managers here and we're all coaches. A coach's job is slightly different to a manager's job. I think you've got to be consistent in what you do. I think you've got to stick to your methods and your ideas and your ideology. As a coach, you're told what to do. As a manager, it's slightly different. Um, and as long as you believe in what you're doing and you're consistent in what you're doing methods are correct and it's like what Gavin said every year it gets harder and tougher because the filtering system gets fit wider and there's a lot of knowledgeable people that are filtered down because they can't get jobs in, in the professional thing and they come to the level that we're at it gets tough so from my own personal point of view as a manager, you've got to be consistent. You've got to be not only consistent with your but you've got to be consistent with your board. You've got to be consistent with your supporters. You've got to be consistent with the reporters because you've got to adhere to all of them people. And as a coach, you just got to be focused on the job that you've got to do 
and believe in the best of your ability. So the question that you ask is a two-pronged question, one for managers and one for, for coaches. I actually believe at the level that we're working at, the people above us don't do anything different to us, especially if you're full-time. And I think talking to my peers and looking at my peers on the screen here, I know that they would probably be doing the same thing. I'll, 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 I'll buy my, my money on it that someone at um, a Division One team would be doing exactly the same as what we're doing. Fantastic. Thanks, Hakan. Pete, I want, Peter, I want to go to you uh, uh, with, the, with the same questions around your key learnings from working within uh, the National League system. Well, I actually picked out the um, word in the question, which is learning. And another thing that I've learned over the years is being adaptable, especially in non-league, um, due to a time of resources. Um, I mean, personally, there's times where I have to go and watch a game myself, unlike maybe in a professional game where you might have specific scouts watching the game. Um, other times you're lucky enough that one of your coaches might be able to do so. Sometimes you might be able to put a phone call into someone that you know that might play the team that you're playing um, in the coming weeks to kind of get information about them. But you really have to be adaptable to what you're facing because, again, sometimes the pitches and the surfaces you're playing on might not allow you to play the way you want to play. Um, we like to get the ball down and play, but, you know, in my first season being the manager, I made the mistakes of always trying to play. We'll go with certain ground and get turned over because the ground wasn't suitable for us to be able to play the football when to play. So I've learned over the years to constantly adapt to the circumstances, to the landscape that you're facing. And that may be the situation of the club. Um, that may be the players you have at your disposal. Um, you know, players get stuck in traffic because they're traveling on a Tuesday evening for two, three, four hours at a time. Um, Non-league is, I think, a place where anything can happen at any time. So you have to be prepared for any eventuality and just have your mindset that you have to be adaptable. Brilliant. Keep learning. Sorry, Peter, last one. What did you say? Thank you. And just keep learning. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. Superb advice from the whole panel. Um, I'm going to open it up to an, a new poll question. Uh, it's going to go to Pav. Pav, uh, I, I think the question is, what do you think are the benefits of working in the non-league game? Do you want to run through uh, the uh, the options that they have, Pav? Yeah, if, if you can all just uh, tick, tick one, one box. Uh, and if there's any other, please state it in the chat box. Uh, that poll's just started now, but so... Uh, can, they, can they pick more than one in this one, Pav? Yeah. Uh, if they go with, 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 with yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. That, that's good news. Cheers, mate. Because yeah, yeah. I'd certainly pick probably four, four of them anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Getting paid sounds good. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that, that was the top one, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm no doubt. I can't wait for those. I hope everyone's answered them because I want to go over um, uh, to ask the panel now uh, the benefits of uh, of working in the non-league game. And, and look, look, we've got a load of aspiring coaches on there. We we know that. Oh, we've got some. Uh, wow, the results. Are, I can see the results coming in as we're speaking. That's quite off-putting, but it's wow. Uh, but Pat, um, as as they're coming in. Can you just talk us through them as they're coming in? Because it's crazy. There's some crazy numbers coming in at the moment. Yeah, you, you, we're looking at 28% obviously as a pathway into the pro game. 16% uh, obviously working with adult players. 11% uh, obviously convenient, uh, obviously combining work with football. Uh, but one of the biggest, obviously, you expect this one, personal professional development, 35%. And then getting paid was 8%, much, and then, yeah. So um, yeah, so personal and professional development is is a big is a biggie, uh, and second pathway into the pro game. It's interesting, isn't it? I wonder if we and we haven't done it, but you know, how many coaches? And I'm I'm just going off script a little bit here for the panel. How many coaches that you come across uh, in the games that you played actually are qualified, lads? Do you, do you know? Don't you know? And if you don't know, uh, um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Have you qualified? 
Sorry? Yeah, I am, mate, just about. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, that, I was, we was only talking off air about that rivalry between Mason and Dunn, where they get nearly 4,000 is to sell out every every time that they play. Uh, oh, nice, yeah. nice one, Hacker, and you've got one right across the bows there. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm it's it's on to reply at some I point. Have to, I have to big him up here because I've had a few clubs, I've, I've moved around, Gavin's been at one club, and to be at one club as long as he has is a testament to him. I think he's been over the 10, 10 years he's been there. For 10 years, he's been consistent in what he's done. He's produced players. His commitment to the club has been unbelievable. You know, and I'm pretty sure that he's had opportunities to move, but he never. And to be at a non-league club or a semi-professional club that's now an elite club for as long as him is, is a remar remarkable achievement. So I have goes off to you, Gav. I can. I, I think he's just dug himself out of a hole there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. well done, mate. Gavin, he's out of himself there. So here's the question. So benefits of working a non-league game. Um, I will go to Pete, Peter, then you first. Uh, and then what I want to do is also, as well as going to Erfan, Gavin and Hakan, Pete and Pav, it'd be interesting to hear your views on the benefits of working in the semi-pro game. It's really, really important that we give our props to Pete and Pav. For a number of years, they've been pushing this space around the non-league game and actually recognising the work that it is. And it's the, one of the first times that we put a webinar on around this uh, around this space. So um, uh, it's really important that we hear your your views on this one as well. But I want to go for you first, Peter Adinyi. Then I'll go to Hakan. Irfan, Gavin, and then I'll finish with Pete Augustine and, and, and Pav. What, what do you think, Peter? Look, look, you can you can pick something from the list or, or, or can you think of something else around the benefits of working in the game? Oh, well, I think you can't get away from the fact that, you know, it gives you time away from the missus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'll put on next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. She's probably watching this right now. So, um, yeah. you know, love you, babes. Um, <laughs> no, but <laughs> one of the main benefits that I've found over the years is the personal and professional development. I mean, personally, uh, you learn so much about yourself um, being in the non-league game, being around like-minded people being around people that will tell you about yourself um as you know on the pitch off the pitch on the sideline we generally don't hold back um in the heat of the battle people will tell you about yourself after the game you have interesting conversations um, regarding football regarding life regarding you know similar situation to other people you think you might be going for a situation and then when you talk to other people you find out that oh if not with me, um, this is quite common, whether personal or professional. But you can't get away from the people you come across. I mean, non-league, all my best friends I've met through non-league, Gav, um, Junior Caddy, Keith Bonus. I mean, I won't know all these people if it wasn't for non-league. And professionally, it's given me an opportunity to develop myself in a way that even I didn't know. I could. Um, I've learned so much in the three, four years that I've been a manager. Um, I found out a lot about myself, um, you know, how patient I can be at times and, you know, how to control my emotions as well and when to show them, when not to. So I think, you know, non-league gives you a lot of opportunities professionally and personally. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. Really conscious, loads of questions uh, coming in the Q&A. And I know that Pete and Pav are keeping an eye on them. And if they haven't, if they've taken their eye on the call, then uh, I'm just telling you now, lads, that there's a load coming through. So I want to make sure that we have at least 20 to 25 minutes to cover off those questions. Um, uh, I, I can't remember the order now, so I'm just going to freestyle it. Gavin, um, I'm going to go to you then, mate. Uh, benefits of working in the non-league game. I can hear you. Um, I think the benefits. Yeah. Um, one sec, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say the benefits um, in working on the game has always been, like Peter said, the player, the personal development, um, the pathway. Uh, my first reason for getting into coaching was obviously to get into professional football. That's the, the dream you have as a, as a kid. You want to get to the highest level of football you can. But along the way, I think the process is important. Uh, the process is important. And then when you get to the end goal, and uh, you learn a lot about what you need to do to get better to be able to get the end goal. 
And I think the end goal is obviously to be in professional football full time, do the best you possibly can. But how you get there, you'll learn that you need to better certain aspects of how you deliver messages, how you take defeat, how you liaise with people, how you communicate generally. Um, there's so many aspects that you learn along the, on the way. Um, when I first started out, I was, I think, a level two coach. Um, I've been an A-licence um, holder for about 10 years. But it took a, it took time, it, it took time along the way. Do you know what I mean? And you learn so much more because you go on the courses, you, you work with, with experienced people, good coaches as well, uh, and you get better. You come away and implement it. Uh, just the same like uh, with games, how you analyse games now to how you did ten years ago is totally different. You're more experienced and you get the opportunity to to grow. So I think that's probably the most important thing. Thanks, Gavin. Um, it's really great to um, uh, to also introduce Andy, who has finally overcome all the technical glitches. <laughs> Princey, great, great to have you on board, mate. I was I was talking about arriving late in the box, mate. That is the latest I've I've seen anyone arrive yet. But fair play. Yeah, yeah but I got on the end of the cross. That's all that matters. <laughs> that's the most important thing. Um, Andy Priest, director of football at Chorley, also manage uh, clubs such as Bury, Worcester. And- Northwich, Airbus and Southport. And I'm really, really pleased um, that, that you've come along. Um, we will, uh, I've, now that now I've got the dynamic duo in the in the room, we will talk about that, that, that wonderful cup run at some point in time. But I just wanted to welcome you aboard, tell you that we're sort of like deep into the questions now. We've just got, we've just opened a poll up asking um, uh, around what are some of the benefits of the, uh, of, of, of working in the non-league game and the highest poll out of the list that we gave was personal professional development. I'm going to give you a moment to think about that while I go to Hakan, um, then Pete, and then uh, Pav, and, Pav and Peter, I'm still going to go to you as well. And then after this, uh, I'll go to you, Andy, last, just to give you a moment to think about that. Hakan, over to you, my friend. Yeah, I think what Peter said was so true and so vital to any coach or manager's sort of progression. You're learning the job while you're doing the job. You're always consistently going to learn the job while you're doing the job. And he said something very important that about himself. So really, while he's learning the job, it's about personal development. And let, let's be honest here, we're a panel of guys. We've all got different strengths and different weaknesses. And we can go on as many coaching courses as we want. But the, ultimately, at the end of the day, you have your own unique way of managing. You have your own unique way of coaching. And what Peter said is so true. He's met most so many people through the game that he's adapted and he's evolved, like Gavin, like Irfan, like Andy, like all of us. But he has his own unique style. And I think that, for me, working in this environment that we're working in now, is you're learning the job while you're doing the job. Not every day is the same. You're going to have highs and lows. You can't, you're going to be a heartbeat. You've got to be consistent in what you believe in. But it's very important that you learn the job while you're doing the job and you're consistent in what you do. You'll find your own strengths and weaknesses. One day will not be the same as the next day. And one day you may be a little bit more angry than the next day. And you've got to be calm and composed to get the best at that session or the best at the individual or the group while you're working. So for me, the biggest plus for me is I've learned the job while I've done the job and I've, I've evolved while I've been doing it and I've found a way that's the right way for me to get the positives across to my team or to the session or to the individual. Would what you say it's so true? Hakan, I, I, you know you mentioned about Gavin get, having 10 years at Dulwich. Do you, yeah. Um, uh, and I, I want to keep keep the question moving, but just one question to you, Hakan. Do you think you get more time uh, uh, with, a, with a project like you've got, or do you, is it just... I, I'll tell you now, I'm not sure about certain... T- I, I work for a very... I work for a big club. In, it's probably one one of the biggest non-league clubs in England. We've actually that was a professional football club. You know, we, are, we can talk here all day long about progression and styles and techniques and whatever. And you're based on results. And if you got two and a half, three thousand supporters baying and screaming and you don't get results, sooner or later they're going to have to make a, a decision. And I think that applies to me at my club. I don't know if it applies to Gavin because he's been there so long. I can't even get rid of him now. But um, 
it, it does, mate. Don't worry it's about just, that. It's it just what it is. I mean, Andy's got, Andy's got the job of now probably picking and sacking the manager. What I'm saying is that if you're lower down, maybe like Peter at Carlton, they'll give you more time. It depends on your budget. Depends on your crowds. It depends. Everyone measures success in different ways, don't they? Every club has a format for measuring success in different ways. Yeah. And for a team like Dulwich or for a team like Maystone, success is probably to is progression and to get out of the league. Right. Everyone's different. Thanks, Hakan. Uh, fan, did I give you the opportunity to answer this question? So, no, get get Andy to get Andy on. I Andy. will do that. Yeah. Um, Precy, before I go to you, um, Peter, Augustine. Um, a real quick one, 30 seconds, benefits of working in a non-league game. Oh, lovely. On mute, mate. Go for it. I, I think one of the things it does is it, it sharpens your approach without a shadow of a doubt. Because when you're working non-league, the one thing that you understand is you understand that you, you have to get results. Uh, I mean, I lost my first two jobs in non-league because I didn't understand that. What I understood was I, I kept thinking about development, development. No, the, the chairman wasn't about that. Jim was about you better get results, otherwise you're gone, fella. And that's what happened to me. So I've avoided it ever since. <laughs> EFP45 Augustine, thanks for that. Really good. <laughs> I've seen over to you, mate. Benefits. Yeah, so yeah I've, I've been around the step five uh, as a player and, and currently as a coach, but for me, convenience. Obviously, I'm a coach developer, but the key thing is staying current, getting on the grass and working with players. That's important. We saw kills delivering courses and whatever, but we need to be on the grass. And I just like the Hakam, Hakam bit around, it's about three points. You know, you're under pressure, so it really tests you as well. Uh, but the biggest thing for, for me is, as well is, is being a role model and being visible uh, to, to black and Asian coaches out there, that there, there is a route through there, and I'm sure Butch will talk about that. But that's a powerful piece, being that role model. And also, most importantly, being part of a vision and being part of something, what you can achieve uh, uh, within a team. So, yeah. Brilliant. Superb. Peter, didn't you? Before I go to Priestley on this one, Peter, your thoughts on uh, uh, on on those benefits? I think have I been to you already? If I have, I'm going to go. Yeah. Oh, Andy, all right, okay, I got that wrong. All right, I'm going to go straight to Priestley then. Uh, over to you, sir. Benefits of, uh, of of being in and around the uh, the the national league system, uh, but for coaches, the message is for you. Oh well, it, for me, it's opportunity. I, I, you know, I had a chance in the league. Um, with them. And, and did reasonably well at Berry, um, but there were no opportunities after it uh, for whatever reason. So what it does, it gives you an opportunity to show what you can, um, and the results are important. Like you say, you know, you, you have to get results, um, but it also makes you, you you have to be more adaptable. You know, in the program, you've got a lot, a lot of things done for you. When you go into non-league, you're going to have to do a lot of those things yourselves. Uh, or you're going to have to find uh, interns or people like that to come and help you. So if not, you're going to do the job yourself. You're going to have to you know, find somewhere to train and things like that. So what a great breeding ground that is for you, you know, to learn all those sort of jobs. And then when you, if you, if, you know, and, and probably, you know, look at, at the opportunities that, that we get and they're very slim and, they, you know, they're slim in non-league. Um, it's tough. Um, but if you get an opportunity, take it. Whatever level, take the opportunity because if you can do well and show that you can do the job, it may lead to another opportunity. Uh, I'm not saying well because, you know, that door is it's pretty close, it's pretty, pretty tightly locked and you're going to have to go and open it somehow. Um, but, Go and take the opportunity um, and show what you can do. Um, and, and, you know, I've had to come out of the league and, and drop down and, you know, drop down and down and down. And even this opportunity, although it's a director of football, is still probably the lowest I've been. So, look, we've had some success. So, again, that puts me back in the shop window a little bit um, that, you know, I can do the job. So, you know, take that opportunity. Don't think it's all about the football league because it's not. You know, there's some real good opportunities in non-league and you've, you've seen the cup shocks um, and you've seen players come out of there and you've seen the odd manager get an opportunity as well. Brilliant. Andy, that is superb. Um, Pete, uh, Pete Augustine, can you open in the next poll, please, and tell us what the question is for the coaches who are listening in? Off mute first, mate. Okay, so the next poll is 
Um, can the non-league game support a culture of diversity and inclusion? And you've got five answers. So choose your answer. Right, um, as, as they're coming through, and wow, this is interesting. There's some really interesting results coming through. But I, I've, I've learned something about these polls is, is, is not to talk too quickly because um, although there's one that's, that looks key, like an awful lot of people are saying strongly agree at the moment. Yeah. What, what are those numbers looking like, mate? So the strongly agree is looking at the moment at 58%. Agree is 30%. Neither agree or nor disagree is nine percent, and disagree is one percent, and strongly disagree is two percent. How do you think they read that question, Peter? Well, I think it says. I think this question says, "Can the non-league support uh, a culture of diversity and inclusion?" It doesn't say, "Does it yeah. support a culture of brilliant, inclusion. brilliant point." So, I want to start with yeah, great, great pickup, Peter. Because uh, you wrote the question, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> um, so, it's interesting, isn't it? So, you know, when we look at the uh, the professional game and the space that you know a number of you have, uh, have been in, and uh, a number of us working, and we look at the underrepresentation of Black and Asian coaches and females within the the game, but we also look at the transition of possibly thirty five percent of players and only five percent. Uh, black or Asian managers within the professional game. It kind of tells us there's a big disparity there and some of the areas that we can really try and look to, to address. So when we look at the non-league game itself, could it be, and, and I think some people already mentioned, could it be a breeding ground for an opportunity for um, ethnically diverse coaches to come and work in? Really interesting one. Want to kick off with... Um, uh, with Andy again, if that's okay, Andy Priest, yeah, um, a, a real opportunity for 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 ethnically diverse coaches. <laughs> uh, can it be? <laughs> well, look, it's a long time we've been talking about this, and I'm so sceptical um, about the opportunities. I look around non-league, especially in the north. I, I very rarely see um, any black staff uh, on the benches. Um, so I, I don't see a, a difference. I, I don't see a difference, especially in the north. Um, but the positive thing is, is that you've got to have that belief that something will change. And that poll says that there's belief out there that things will change because the, the question was can, and the majority have said that they they believe so. For me, that's positive because once you once you don't believe that is, then then you're giving up. Um, what we're going to do to make sure that can is a will, it will change. You know, that's what we're you know that's what we're all talking about at the moment is you know how we're going to make that change. Brilliant, thanks, Andy. Gavin, over to you. Um, thoughts? Yeah, I think I think down south it's a little bit more. There's there's more diversity. Um, I wouldn't say great numbers greater numbers in the north but a, a lot more than I think Andy probably sees um, and I think um, non-league is definitely an environment where uh, more ethnic coaches can get opportunities um, I, I say that because <clears throat> I think there's politics everywhere don't get me wrong there's politics everywhere um, but I do think there's less less of the politics in non-league football and I came into non-league coaching and managing at the very bottom um, which there's no eyes on it. There's no big prize. There's, you know, there's nothing on it. And I think if guys are willing to work their way right from the bottom and prove themselves, um, you know, it might take a bit of time or a bit more time. And you might think that's unfair. But at the end of the day, you know, you need to get in. And if you if you show passion, then get in and prove your worth. Um, and I think sometimes we may look at oh, this, this ex-professional just got a job at the top club. He didn't do anything. Do you know what? That's not you. Concentrate on who you are uh, and do the best you possibly can. Work from the bottom if you have to. Uh, keep proving yourself. And at some point, um, the opportunities will come, I think. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gavin. Um, I want to go to you, Hakan, next. Um, 
the the, the question this, this was is around a, this is a like uh, sore subject for me. I've had this conversation with you many many times. Uh, I'm quite outspoken about it, and I've always said this, and I'm not going to change my thoughts. Racism isn't a or is cultural. I've said it many, many times. I do agree with Gavin. There's probably more opportunities in South than there is maybe up north after what Priestley said. But it's not about colour. It's cultural now. Now, my personal background, that my father originates from Egypt, who's a, who's a black man, and my mother is a Mediterranean descendant. But yet, when my CV goes into a football club, the first thing they'll see is not my ability, but my name. And that's the difference where I think that it is not about colour no more, it's cultural, and I've said this from day one. About 10 years ago, I sat in a room with Simone from the PFA, and I was surrounded by my peers, that were all ex-professional footballers with the likes of Ricky Hill, None of them have got jobs now. Nothing's really changed from that point of view. But what I can say now is that for all these young, expiring coaches that are coming through, it's down to us to help them. We are their pioneer. We're the, we're the shining light for these guys to get in. I always, and I said this and I've always said it, if someone approaches me of a different colour and origin, and his pathway has been blocked so many times, I'm always willing to help that person, either he can come in. And I'm doing it right now with someone who could never have got a chance in a million years. He's doing his eight since. I said, just come in and shadow me. It's an experience. We were fortunate enough, some of us, to play professional. We are also fortunate enough, some of us, to work at some very good clubs. And what Priestley said is so true. You know, he's been there and he's experienced that, like me and like most of the panel here, it's, it's not about colour, it's cultural now, and it's down to us to help all these diverse cultural guys that are coming through to show them the way. That's, that's what I do. And I've said that from day one. I haven't, and I'm, I've been a little bit out about it. Um, and I've even been at a kick it out event when, you know, the, the word Bambi was used and it was it was honed in on a particular colour and not, not cultural. And, and that, I think we need to widen our horizon even more so because there's so many ethnic groups that are Mediterranean and so many ethnic groups that are, that are from different parts of the world that need help as well. So it's down to us to help them. I think we're in a position of force. We're in a position of power for however long that may be. And if we can just get one person through the door, I think that's a success. And I do agree, in the South, there's more opportunities because we probably live in more of a diverse area, culturally. I mean, I'm from North London. I can tell you we've got every ethnic background in, in that area as possible. And they're all out there, and they're all hoping for that chance. Hakan, thank you so much. Butch, can I just come in on, can I just come in on that? Uh, yeah, I was gonna. Yeah. I was gonna go to you next. Yeah, um, it's really refreshing again to hear what Hakan's had to say. Uh, definitely agree that there's more opportunities, probably, and more representation down south than up north. Um, but up north, it's a total different world, and down south, it's, it's crazy. We're such a small country, but the difference it's it's uh, very very big uh, from both areas. And um, I've got to I've got to say I'm not sure whether. Bammy is the right word to use because it's like putting everybody in one pot and saying, there you go, Bammy. But within that, there's so many different cultures, religions, nationalities, all sorts. So is Bammy the right word to use? I'll just give you an example. So the word South Asian gets thrown about a lot in the Asian. But within that, you've got different religions. So you use the word South Asian, but then for me, what about the South Asian Muslims? because they have a different need to people who are South Asian. So I'm a Muslim, I'm from Muslim, Muslim background, yeah? So if you look at our our so-called 
barriers or potential barriers or look at our needs, the difference to people of South Asian. But people who aren't South Asian Muslim don't understand that because they're not yeah. from that community. So we fast in Ramadan. We have to pray five times a day. We we visit we visit we visit the mosque. You know our 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 upbringing is totally different. So you can't label everybody in one area. You have to understand what everyone's needs cultures are before you start to address any sort of potential barriers. So if we're using the word bami, what does that actually mean? Because you're just telling everybody to go into that pot. He's right. right. Thanks, uh, Fan. Um, I want to I want to move on. I'm conscious, um, uh, Pete. Peter uh, Adinia, we didn't we didn't get your um your, your views on this one with regards uh you know could it could it be potentially an opportunity for ethnically diverse coaches to to work through uh, and, and and make it into the game through the non league system? Um, yeah, I'll make my one very quick. I think it definitely can be. Um, I mean, I clearly go by my personal experiences, and when I look back twenty years ago, twenty two years ago when I started playing there wasn't that many black managers or people of ethnic backgrounds on the sideline. Um, looking at the likes of Akan, Gavin, like I said, I've played underneath Gavin as a player twice, is is important to see people like yourself. Um, I'll possibly want to have considered coaching and managing if I didn't see Gavin doing it and knowing that, okay, someone that looks like me, that I know personally, is able to do it. And that kind of opened up my eyes. And what I've noticed over the years is there's more and more, you know, ethnic and black coaches on the sideline, which which is great. And I think it's always important to see people like yourself that are going to open up the doors, gather, open up many doors for many people. I can, like you said, he's still doing it. I'm sure Efran is doing it where he is. Um, I, I look at the teams like Maidstone, Dulwich, Carshall, and where I'm at, Turner Mitchum. Sutton's Academy is run by Marvin, who is also a black guy. Um, Aaron Gay, that's an ethnic manager at that place. So over the years, is improving. And I know possibly it's not quick enough, as quick as we would like it. But I think it's on all of us. Um, and webinars like this, discussing these issues openly, where we could actually learn from each other. Uh, we open up more doors for the next generation coming up behind us that yes, it is possible and they can achieve their goals and their dreams. It is going to be difficult, but we always have to be optimistic that it can be done. That's brilliant, Peter. Pav, I want to go to you because I want to open the next up the, the next poll up. Pav, if you want to go to you and just ask the question to the coaches, please. Yeah, the next question is around can the non-league game develop managers uh, for the for the pro game? So I'm just going to put that. I know, and it, you know, this is uh, obviously... It's not just a breeding ground for, for players, but it's also where a lot of managers learn their trade as well. So, yeah. Just a couple of examples there, Butch, in terms of just top of head. Uh, Paul Hurst, I think he worked at Ilkeson Town uh, in the Northern League uh, when he got a job at Ipswich. Uh, maybe Tommy Wright as well. Uh, obviously, he worked at Corby Town, uh, Leeton Town, and then he's at Spennymore now. So, so it's com it's coming out. Ooh, it's strongly agree. You're looking at forty three percent agree, forty six percent. Excellent. So but, it's interesting. Isn't you've, it? you've got you've got a number. You've got a Neil Warnock, Chrissy Wilder, Cowley Brothers, Steve Evans. There's low, There's a number of people uh, coaches that have moved up from non league. It's it, I'm, I'm looking at those numbers as well. There is. It's very much in the camp of agree and strongly agree, isn't it? it uh, I want to. Yeah. I want, I want to go, I, I'm, I'm conscious of the time uh, and uh, rather than uh, labour this point, because I think we've we've talked a little bit about it, we've touched on it just with the previous question as well. Um, Pete, if I went to your poll now around developing players, so coaches in particular who are, who are listening in, I mean, you know, the type of players that we're, you, you're going to be working in, you're going to work in 11 a side game, it's the adult game as well, but also it's opportunities to work in the 16 to 18 as well. So, um, Pete, if I can just go to your poll question, mate, for the, for the coaches. Which, which Pete? Oh, uh, me. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 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 
Here we go. 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 That's why when you have two pizzas on the call, it gets I know. confusing. You should eat a pizza, shouldn't you? <laughs> You're still thinking about that cross, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still thinking of, yeah, I'm still thinking about the fact that I, I can't remember it. <laughs> so what we've got, Pete, it looks like they're coming through, some numbers are coming through. Yeah, it, it, we're looking at strongly agree, 53%. Uh, agree, 39%. Neither uh, agree or disagree, 7%. Uh, disagree one percent and strongly disagree one percent. Uh, I want to go. I want to go to. Um, I want to start with Gavin if I can, um, uh, Gavin, because that it's a really interesting one, isn't it? So you know, co we we want to coach the coaches to make the players better. That's the idea. Um, great opportunity within uh, the non-league game, but also, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've been fascinated by the, the some of the sixteen to eighteen programs in particular. You know, some some of the stuff that you're doing, uh, Gavin, as well around. It's it's not only about football, is it? It's about transforming lives as well. Uh, yeah, we we started our program sixteen to eighteen year olds about eighteen years ago now, um, <clears throat> and we basically had a group of lads who just missed out on scholarships, and a few that weren't quite good enough for scholarships, uh, or deemed not to be at the time, uh, and they all lived in quite rough backgrounds. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in Peckham and they were in the surrounding South London area like that. And we thought that these kids could go to down to crime. You know what I mean? We'd lose them, uh, but they were very talented. So we set up a programme, uh, which there's a lot of programmes like this now anyway, where they, they, they study uh, and they play football um, as professionally as possible. So it might be three days of training or four days of training um, allied with their, uh, their, their education. And what we found was a lot of boys would not have studied unless it was for the football because they had the passion for football. Um, and because they were so active, they were they were doing their football, which took a lot out of them, doing education took a lot out of them. They didn't have any time for misdemeanours or, or it was a lot less on. And so we felt that we gave some boys a lot of opportunities to stay on the, on the right pathway, create careers for themselves in and out of uh, the classroom, so going into you know maybe university or into careers into in the corporate world even, and then still doing well uh, on football. Um, and we produced quite a few football players, uh, and from there on in, uh, got more confidence to continue reaching out to kids and not only trying to create footballers, but trying to make sure you gave them a pathway into into a better future. Fantastic, Gavin. Precy, I want to go to you around um, the question, and, and like it's come through pretty clear that you know the non-league game can develop players to go into the pro game. Any examples from uh, from some of the work that you're doing at Chorley as director of football? Well, it, you know, it looks like um, you know uh, Harry Cardwell's dropped dropped out uh, from Grimsby, um, and he's come and played for us. And now he's on loan at Stockport. There's a few clubs watching him about going back in. Now he's only been with us for five or six months, um, but you know he's he's developed again over that period. Um, I think the development of players they come. What happens is they come. They they're all probably been in academies at some point during their you know eight or nine or ten, and they drop out and. They find it really difficult, or their older ones, 16, 17, 18, that drop a drop out, um, and it's then catching those players and then convincing non-league is an opportunity for them to get back into the league. Um, and there's still a lot of snobbery about it. You know, lads won't even come, you know won't come on loan um, because it's out of the league. They only want to. I only want to play in the league. I don't want to play non-league. Um, they don't realise how tough it is, um, and we've got you know two or three lads who we've took this this season who've been in academies. One, Ollie Shenton, made his debut at Stoke. Uh, the youngest lad to make his debut at Stoke, sixteen there for seven years. So, uh, I think it's seven years, um, and I think that was one of his only games. Um, only had a couple of loan spells. He's come to us, played regular this season, and you can see how much he's developed just in the last six months. Now there's still an opportunity that he can get back. I feel that you know that he's got the got the tools to do that. 
Um, but he, you know, he's had seven years where he's been at a club where he's not not really been out alone. He's been playing twenty eighteens, twenty ones, twenty threes, and not the football toughens you up. You know, it it makes you realise, especially when they're coming on loan, what you've got. You know, you, you've got everything done for you. Again, you come into non-league, and you've got to find it, find your own feet. You know, no one's gonna gonna uh, get your boots and, and clean them for you, and take them to the game for you, and, and everything's gonna be set out. You're gonna have to do that yourself. So it's a great breeding ground, and I think once you get that opportunity to go back in, yeah, you're not gonna drop back in non-league yet. You know, you're going to have that hunger. And that's why you see lads go on very quickly. They go into maybe from non-league into League One or Two, and then they do really well there, and then they push on and end up in the Premier League like a Vardy or people like that. Yeah. How about yeah. Alex Newby, Andy, as well? We had a, we had Alex Newby, Rochdale yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. He, he came um, to before, us. I, before I go to you, Hakan, um, your thoughts on that? Um, can we develop players that, you know, can, can the National League develop players that go into the program? I know uh, a number, number of examples. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it's so diverse now. From my time, and I've mentioned this to you much before, I work with Jimmy Gilligan, who works for the FIS still now. We produced three players from Barking Abbey Academy that went on to become professional footballers, one being Wesley Thomas, the other one being Bradley Johnson. And now it's like I said, it's so wide now that, that like the net's so wide that, you know, these young lads get the opportunity to play during the week, you know, and if they do well, they're spotted and they're set up. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. It's so much better now than what it was when we used to play because the lads that were in non-league football didn't probably have the opportunity but the development from from the youth level to the men's game and the progression that they're making during that period there uh, is is undoubtedly a good good place for them to, to start there. there's lots lots of lads that are being picked up we had a lad at Maidstone uh, been there since he was a kid We've done ever so well. 17, he's now signed a two-year contract at Cheltenham. So there are, and you, you'll find now, when you go and watch FA Youth Cup games at non-league level, you'll find a lot of professional scouts going to them games to scout these kids. And, and it, it, it's much better now than what it was. Much that's, better that's, now. That's, that's brilliant. I, I'm conscious of the time. and it, it, Seven minutes past. We're going to finish at half past. So I, I know I want to go to Pete and Irfan, but I want to start you off with the final question before we go actually to the Q&A. And we've literally got 30 seconds each for each one. So this is the final question to the panel. If there was one word which summed up your career up to now, what would it be and why? Irfan, I'm going to start with you. Then I'm going to go to Peter Denyi. And then I'll uh, and then and then I have my lucky pick between Gavin, Andy, and Hakan. After that, Irfan, one word and why? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna extend that to two words: resilience and perseverance. Um, I think I think without them two, um, it's very difficult to have some sort of career in in the game and stay in the game, which is even tougher. Thanks, mate. Peter Dinny, one word. Um, mine would be to be open-minded. Um, I need a double barrel word, but just to be op open-minded with everything around you regarding all the words that have been used, resilience, perseverance, hard working, learning. Um, your mind is constantly has to be open. Mine has been over the last 22 years and, I've, you know, just looking at these guys that I've worked with, that I've played against, that I've played with, you know, I'm constantly just trying to keep my mind open and try and learn and soak as much as I can. Brilliant. Thanks. Gavin, um, one word which sums up your career up to now, what would it be and why? Um, <clears throat> perseverance, I think. Um, I feel that you get lots of highs and lows in football as you do in life. Um, and I feel that you need to have perseverance in order to continue because obviously the, the, the highs are a lot easier to, to ride, the lows are a lot harder and it's more challenging um, with your, your character um, and I think that's one of the key things that you need to do. 
Fantastic. Before I go, Andy Priest, Pav, Pete, just to line you up now, okay? I'm sure you've got all the questions lined up. What we'll do with the questions is that um, if you see one and you think, let's give it to one panel member, and that way we can get as many questions as possible rather than go through all five panel members answering them. So I'll leave it up to you to, to decide who the panel member is that answers the question. Uh, Andy Priest, one word that sums up your career up to now and why? Uh, belief for me. Um, you <laughs> You've got to believe, you know, we're talking about opportunities. You've got to believe that those opportunities are going to come. Um, obviously, I've, I've dropped down, so I've had to believe that I can get back there because um, I've got to have that goal. And if I don't believe that I can get that, you know, then I surely won't. Um, and if you don't, if you don't think that you're going to get anywhere in the game, then you know, you, you, you've had it. Um, so you've got to believe that, that everything is going to change and... Um, you know, for 20 odd years, <laughs> I've kept that belief and I keep believing. Listen, that, that has been tremendous. Right. It's open to the coaches now. Pete, Pav, um, over to you, mate, with the q and A. I'll, I'll just go on to Andy there. Andy, there's a question here from Brian, uh, just around your roles and responsibilities. He wants to know how does that flow through the club? What are your tactics and strategies around that? Um, well, being... The director of football, uh, you know, I'm included in everything. The manager is the main, the main man. He, you know, he desi decides uh, what we're going to do. Um, I'll help him. You know, he'll he'll talk to me and ask for advice. Um, but outside the first team, he sort of gives me a free hand. So I'll look after the education side and the scholars, which. Uh, you know, that program that Gavin was talking about, that 16 to 18-year-old program, which we just started. So I'll deal with that. I'll deal with the youth, with, with Irfan. Um, so we'll we'll plan a, a strategy of what we're going to do, what, what we're looking for for our 16s to come all the way through and be part of our first team. Now, we're very early. To that. I've only been in the job, uh, the, the director of football job, for uh, about six, seven months. So there's a long-term strategy now that we've got that we want to really produce our own players um, for our, for the first team and something that's never been tried at, at Chorley before. So it's putting all that together, putting those steps together. Um, and, you know, we're still, you know, we're still planning that and going through that and myself and Earth and all the time. It's not going to happen overnight. You don't just suddenly get a player come through to the first team. Um, although we've been fortunate that we've had a couple come through um, this season. But, um, yeah, you just have to put your strategy together to work along. And when we're talking about long-term strategies, something that is in the background is not about results. So I've got the time to see that through. Now, you know, the first team manager can get on with his job. He doesn't have to wor worry about um, producing for his first team at 16, 17, 18. Sounds like a real multidisciplinary approach, uh, Andy. Uh, but that's fantastic. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, I've got one here from Sonny Moore, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'm gonna pass what someone over to Hakan. Hakan, what do you think? Uh, Sonny asked a question. What do you think more exposure in the non-league looks like? Oh, that's a difficult question because we're getting a lot of exposure now. Um, I mean, the National League has got exposure on TV. I think it was on the Quest Channel. Uh, we, we got a load of publications on on, on on websites with different bits and pieces. And, of course, you've got the national paper that comes out once a week. Uh, like I said, the, the National League now is called an, is an elite for a reason. And I think there's going to be more sort of lights sort of shone upon that level and then it'll probably filter down. That's what I believe. Okay. And I think it's the start of a new era. You know, this pandemic has taught us a lot. Let's not forget that. To be recognised with the title of elite, elite, elitist is a big thing. If you can, you've been given a title, you want to keep it, didn't you? So I think they're going to try and push that even more so now. That's what I believe. Okay. Cool. Pav? Yeah, Gavin, uh, you can say yes or no here, but there's a question here from Waid. Have you ever had to change the way you approach training or even compromise your philosophy if the job isn't going well? Who's that to me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, Gavin. Um, not training. 
Um, I think training, I think um, Hakan said earlier, you've got to believe uh, in your way and stuff like that. Um, you've got to believe in your ide ideology and, and things like that. I think when you come up against an opposition that are clearly better than you, you've got to drop your ego as a, as a coach and a manager. Um, that's, that's, that's clear. So you'll still have your same principles, but you'll, you'll, you'll think about how you can still be effective in the game, how you can stay in the game and how you can possibly still hurt the other team. Yeah. But you don't you like change your whole philosophy because the other team are better than yours. Fantastic. Great answer there, Gav. Okay, um, I've got a question here from Taryn Jagdish Kohli, and I'm going to put this one to um, Pete. Um, uh, and he, he asked this question I'm a student at Manchester Metropolitan University doing my MSc in sports management. What opportunities can I look forward to in the football industry? Um, I think it'll be like any other line of work. I mean, you just, you just got to be on the lookout, try to network as much as you possibly can. Um, I think for most of us that have been players, it's possibly easier because um, you're in and around it all the time. If you're not playing at the moment, then it'll be a case of like contacting clubs like I kind of said previously, he's always looking to our people and, you know, if they sound right and they're talking the right way and conducting themselves properly, it will take them on. Same with Vasa Castro and we've got people constantly coming in, shadowing Keith mainly because he's the head coach um, and, you know, with his wealth of experience, I'm always encouraging any young coaches to come along because I'm learning from him. Um, so the biggest thing would be networking as much as you can, send messages, send emails, make phone calls. Um, the guys have mentioned about perseverance earlier on. And time and time again, you might get 50 knockbacks, but you're just looking for that one door to be open for you. And hopefully you land at the right place. Okay. You guys are going to be inundated after this. You realise that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we've, got, we've got about 30 questions here. But yeah, my phone uh, hasn't stopped as we're talking. It's just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Irfan, uh, question for yourself. Just, it says, how have you managed the balance of learning and development, your normal job, family and planning sessions? Have you, have you managed a multitask, uh, all that? What advice would you give the coaches? You got if you love sleeping and lions, then forget it. <laughs> <laughs> it it's uh, it's incredible time management and um, really. So if you've got twenty four hours in a day, um, really cutting that down. So what? How much time you spending sleeping? How much time you spending eating? How much time you spending doing this? How much time you spending doing that? And you're always going to have time left over, and it's what you do with that time left over. So in that time left over, you're going to watch EastEnders and line of duty, or are you going to try and be better at your job? That, that's that's what it goes down to. No, I love that, uh, fan. Time management, and it goes back to the stuff around making sacrifices. Thank you. Right, I think we're done there, Butch. Um, I've, I've got, I've got that. A lot, loads of questions. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> so I've, I've got one here. This is from Daniel Scott, and he asked the question: Are FA badges more recognised than? Uh, than an degree in uh, from universities in non-league football, and I'm going to put give that to. Um, I'm going to give that to Andy. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, badges are they uh, <laughs> difficult? Because from, from my experience, I, you know, I did look. I, I, I lost out on a job to someone who had a B license. I had a pro license, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it just uh, it's a bit of an head scratcher that one. Um, so I don't know. You know, look, you have to get you have to get your badge. Um, they will be recognised, no doubt. They will be recognised. Um, but will they ultimately get you that job? No, they they, they won't. You know, if you just sit there with a pro license, you walk and think, oh, well, I've got a pro license, I'm going to get a job. You, you know, you, you're going to have to do more than that. Um, you're going to have to get a bit of it. You're just going to have to tick all the boxes. That's what I say. Just try and tick all those boxes. You know, the, they might want someone who's worked in an academy. So make sure you've done a little bit of work in, in an academy and, and you can say, I've done that experience. That um, You know, you just got to look for what people want. Um, and the more experience you can get and go and ask, you know, just, just 
knock on people's doors like uh, like you were saying there before. You know, just go and ask. Go in, volunteer. You know, volunteer. just say, look, I'm here. I, you know, I just want to watch. I just want to observe. You don't know what it leads to. But sitting back and hoping and sending CVs in, um, you know, a lot of jobs are gone gone before you can get your CV in front of anybody. Mm. So try and get experience, try and get into clubs, use all your networking. My, my, my biggest thing and probably the thing that I didn't do enough was enough networking. You know, just just make as many as many contacts as you can in the game because um, and then you can call on them and, and, and ask them for, for a favour. Can, you know, can I come in and have a look? Um, but, the, you know, get your badges. You must get those badges because that will be the biggest excuse. Oh, oh no, you're, you're not qualified enough. Mm. I got, I got, thanks, Andy. And, and that has got to be the line of the webinar without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I lost out someone uh, with the UA for when I had a phone <laughs> telling you. Uh, mate, that, that, if that ain't on your CV. Um, <laughs> Pav, over to you, mate. I know you've got another question. I'll just, yeah, I'll give this to, to the old panel. Uh, it's a question from Brian. Um, you know, we've got a lot of coaches from different backgrounds on, on call today. But the question's around. Uh, have you have, to, have you dealt with adversity uh, within within your roles, you know? And how did you handle that? I think that's a really important question for for, for the for the learners and coaches on the panel. Have you dealt with adversity, and how did you get, overcome it? And that's to the whole panel. Anyone can answer that. I deal with it every day. <laughs> every day I deal with it. It's no different yeah. to me. <laughs> Let's be honest. Every day I deal with it. Every day. You have to deal with the situation at hand, you know, and uh, mm. you could be talking to your players, you could be going out. It's no different. So what it's a way, for me, it's a way of life now. Mm. It's second nature. And um, I have a diverse group of players with, from different backgrounds. And um, I don't do free shame. They're all the same to me. But I, every day, I have to deal with that every day. A way of life for me. Yeah. And just on that, I can, you know, that self-awareness piece and our own biases. What, yeah. what sort of biases have you had to overcome um, as a coach manager as, as well? If I told you some stories, yeah. I think you'd, there'd be a lot of bleeps and a lot of varying out. I can, yeah. You ain't <laughs> past the watershed yet, mate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, yeah, right. I've dealt with quite a lot personally. Yeah. Uh, because of the colour of my skin and my name. I've learned in, in today's society that it's the way of life and I've had to deal with it and no more so than when I was working for the Luton town who's, and if anyone knows the area of Luton it's probably the most diverse area possible you've got more Muslims around, around than anything else yeah, I would get verbally abused sometimes by different different people. So, and you have bald shoulders to accept that. And we're in this industry for a reason, because we love the job that we do. And therefore, you have to accept the rough with the smooth. And sometimes you've got to be bigger than them, and then walk away from situations. And, and <clears throat> no different, even now when we go to ground. So, I, I can talk probably for most of the panel here that have experienced something like that. For me now, it's second nature. I'm used to it and I can deal with it. I've learned how to deal with it. It's part of my DNA. It's part of my own development. It's part of my, and I use the word professional, my professionalism now. Uh, Pete, Thank you, Akka. thanks for that, Hakan. Um, Pete, have you got a last one before I uh, I get to wrap this up and just give the, the, the panel a uh, final one uh, question to think about? Right. Okay. I'm going to give this one to Gavin because this this was uh, this was um, uh, uh, sent into Gavin. So, Gavin, uh, how did how did your work with the Spartans influence your methods in terms of player development, and how have you managed to continuously evolve as a manager uh, after after over a decade at Dulwich Hamlet? Um, I think at this time, starting off with the academy, we had kids that were good at football. Um, but they were rough diamonds and they needed polishing up in terms of their, um, their 
the way they behave within football and within society. So we concentrate on their on their play, their personal development really, um, how they conduct themselves when they come into a into a room and stuff like that. And and they probably thought what we're doing this for, but we all know in life that you know how you conduct yourself speaks uh, volumes. Um, so we did a lot of player development stuff, um, <clears throat> social awareness uh, stuff as well. Um, whilst we were still developing them as players, um, and the two went hand in hand, and now got in my dressing room now we still have some of the same ethos in terms of respect, uh, win or lose. Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, we respect each other. Um, you know, everyone, the cleaning lady, uh, up, up to the, the you know the director of the club or whatever, everyone gets the same level of respect, regardless of the result. I think. Um, it's great. We all talk about the technical side. We all talk about our ambition, but I think we're all people and we should conduct ourselves in a certain manner, in a certain way. Um, and I think that's how people, if you can have respect, I think we can all go in the, in the right direction, uh, no matter what company you're in. Um, but we've always had that ethos from the academy and we've brought it through into our into our first team environment as well. Um, and I think that's held us in good stead. Thanks, Gavin. Pete, thanks for that. Um, the, the, the webinar was around opportunities for aspiring coaches in the semi-pro game. I want to finish with that with that question. And the way I want to finish with it is, first of all, you know, and I started off with some staggering figures when it came to the National League system. Um, if we're talking about opportunities in, in the National League system, there's 1,676 clubs in the National League system. There are a total of 9,669 clubs in there. Uh, uh, teams in there. My apologies. You know, there's 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 five uh, there's there's fifty five thousand seven hundred ninety four players within that system as well. So when coaches are coming in now and talking about like we I, I want to get straight into the pro game. I, I I think what I would I would the message that I'm hearing in particular is you know there is a pro game and everyone uh, everyone would like to break into it, but there are opportunities elsewhere. And I wanted to finish off with the last question in the last three or four minutes. And, and, and I'll go through each panel member if I can. Is there, um, so I'm an aspiring coach and I would like some help. Um, what type of help um, do you think is available? Uh, um, say, for example, either at your club or opportunities in and around uh, where, where you might be for me to get an opportunity to understand the craft of coaching learn about uh, coaching and developing uh, myself as a coach as well. Um, and uh, if I, first of all, uh, Gavin, if I can go to you first, then I'll go to you, Andy, then Peter Adinyi, then Irfan, and then we'll finish with Hakan. Gavin, over to you first. I think, yeah, everyone's different, uh, what their needs and wants are. So it depends on the individual. But um, what we have on offer, obviously, when we're back to, back to normal, will be we've got coaching sessions at youth level, um, at senior level that they can come in, watch, ask questions, depending on where they are, even take part. We, we do it all the time anyway. Um, we're an open door. Um, and I think the, the main thing is as long as you're serious and you're, you're dedicated and we're willing to help, we understand what it's like. I think everyone's touched on opportunities not being easy. So I think we all probably realise that we have to do the opposite to what, you know, we, we face ourselves, you know, so... I think all of our doors are open and definitely for us, our doors are open. That is brilliant, Gavin. Thank you so much. Andy Priest, over to you, sir. Opportunities. Yeah, we're exactly the same. You know, uh, if any anybody wants to come in uh, and work alongside myself and, and Irfan, um, get involved. You know, we're given opportunities all the time and we, we've had lads come in to us, um, you know, volunteering. Um, and then they've been, then they've got a few expenses, and then the next minute, you know, they're on the on the payroll. That that's that's how it how it happens. Um, so, you know, any anybody can get in touch with myself or or Irfan who's in the area. And like you said, when when things open up a little bit, um, you know, just you can come in and uh, and shadow us or, or you know co coach our lads and help you get through your your licenses if if you need uh, teams to to work with. You know, we'll help you definitely. Thank you so much, Andy. Peter? Oh, well, personally, um, 
for my time, I charge about hundred pound an hour. So if you're not, <laughs> um, is that okay? <laughs> well, I like to keep it reasonable, so you know. You don't like, you know. <laughs> no, but like, like the previous two have said, we're pretty much the same as Carl Shorten. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I'm full time at the club. So I run the 16 to 18 Academy at the club, um, same as Esquire Program at Dulwich and Chorley's new one. I've been doing that for two years now. So I've been full time at Carl Shorten for two years. And we have people coming in during the day. Um, so the Academy coaching sessions. Then the training free coaching sessions, the first team coaching sessions, we constantly have coaches coming in, helping. Like I mentioned there, that you've got Keith Bonus, and I don't think you're going to find many coaches or better coaches at our level or the level above or in the pro game. Um, he's been doing it for over 30 years. I'm constantly learning from him. And like I said previously, always encouraging coaches to come in and watch him at work and pick up as much as they possibly can. So we're, we're an open door as well. And anyone that is willing to put in the work, you never know when the opportunity is going to arise. And if you're in the right place at the right time, that's, you know, how some things happen for, that's how it happened for me. And I'm pretty sure other coaches will have the same experience. So feel free to come. Thanks, Peter. I'm going to give Erfan 30 seconds, and Hakan 30 seconds, so we yeah. can... No, just, just, just. Uh, Andy's, Andy's obviously covered for us. We're open door. We're open to giving opportunities to anybody who wants to get involved and, and is willing um, to learn. But just, just quickly from me, just advice is that um, people who've come onto this uh, webinar is never stop learning. Um, any coach, any level, even if at the highest level to to grassroots, just never stop learning. Having that mindset, you are always learning as coaches. We never know everything. Thanks, Erfan. Final words, Hakan. Yeah, I think I said earlier on in the program, we're the pioneers. We're the we are the we're the, we're the ones that set the trail, and uh, if we can help, which we will, no doubt there's been coaches that have been approached by so many different people to to speak to other coaches to come in, and that that that's the way forward. But I think that we 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 are the the guys that can lead the way for these prospective coaches coming through and, and showing the way. It's down to us. Thank you so much. On the shoulders of some really great giants here, I really appreciate your time. It has been 90 minutes of real insightful, informative discussion and discourse as well around the non-league game. It's about time we shone a light on it. We have done now. Massive appreciation to not only the panellists, but also to Pav and Pete and to Kate and to Matthew in the background who's, who, who've kept the wheels running. Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Have a great evening and we will see you soon.